Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do you, your disciples, not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, Envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Fish or cut bait. You know that phrase? Yeah. Fish or cut bait. There are some more that I thought of, like, don't just stand there. Do something. Do something, right? Or the Buddha say, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> but we're doing the Christian version today. Uh, how about put up or shut up? Shut up. Move it or lose it. You can't just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. Okay, so that we've got the whole Bible <laughs> in a nutshell for today, right? It kind of hits us over the head like a hammer. Right? <laughs> All three lessons are saying kind of the same thing. Uh, put up or shut up, uh, don't just talk the right way, but act the right way. It's not just words, it's what you do. So we get the idea, one basic idea, actions speak louder than words, uh, pious intentions are not enough, And overall, the Lord has behavioral expectations of us. Okay? Now, consider our spiritual ancestors. Consider the Israelites out there in the desert. This is in the book of Deuteronomy that we read for our first lesson. Our spiritual ancestors had just experienced the grace of Almighty God. They had experienced God's love. 
because God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And now they were preparing to enter Graceland. That's an Elvis <laughs> metaphor, right? They were going into the land of grace, the place that heaven had promised them through their patriarchs and their matriarchs. And God, their Savior, had a plan for them. He didn't just expel them into the desert for no good reason. He had a good reason. And that is to make those chosen people a blessing for the whole world. So they were not just to say, the Lord is our God and our Savior, but they were to act beneficently on behalf of the entire world. God wanted them to create a social order, a society in which everybody is blessed, a society in which everyone counts, everyone has enough and not more than enough, a society in which justice would be the norm. So Israel, our spiritual ancestors, were being summoned by their Savior to serve as a moral example on an international scale. That's where the statutes and ordinances come in. The statutes and ordinances were to help them be that blessing that they were made to be. A summary of the uh, ordinances and statutes would be what we call the Ten Commandments, right? And a summary of that is what? Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor. Neighbor as yourself. So that's the same dynamic in all three of these lessons. Love of God and God's love for us produces action that blesses other people. Love of God, love of neighbor as self. Brother James, in the second lesson, would refer to this as the implanted word that impels us toward the world in compassion and healing. So Deuteronomy, James, and Mark, they're all of one voice, and we get it. Restrain our evil hearts and act so that God's righteousness is re released into the world. But, and there's always a however, isn't there? <laughs> if we're honest, right? So we're supposed to act so God's love gets enacted in the world, but if only it were that simple, if only it was so unambiguous, our Israelite ancestors are exhibit A of this ambiguity. They're about to enter the promised land. This is the heritage that was given to them by God to their, through their ancestors. But wait, there were people already there Do they fall outside of God's love? Are they not object of God's justice? If the Israelites are the chosen people, how about the people in the land already? Are they the unchosen? Flash forward a whole bunch of centuries 
to the 19th century and the Zionist movement in Europe. One of the slogans of that Zionist movement was, here is a land without people for a people without land. And then flash forward to today. In our own minds, how are we to think with our Christian faith about what God intends for all those people that are now in that land of promise? Jews and Palestinians, how do you pray for them? ancestors of the people who were already there and the ancestors of the people who came laterally. How do you pray? How do you vote? How does God's kingdom of justice and righteousness come for two people? Two nations. If you came here for the answer, you won't get it. But I don't know. But it's before us. The land without people, no. The land with lots of people. It's enough to make you want to give up. Throw your hands in the air and eat a whole pint of Ben and Jerry's at one sitting. Of course, you've never done that. I'm just making that up. But that is not an option for Christ's disciples who have been called to be a blessing as our three lessons are emphasizing today the truth about us has been given to us this morning by brother James he says the father of lights has given us birth by the word of truth that is to say we were baptized by the word of truth, who is Jesus, the word made flesh. So our baptism places us smack in the middle of all these moral ambiguities that we face after we've heard God call us to be a light to the nations and a blessing to our neighbors. This is that word from God. This is that Jesus who is the word from the Father. This is that Jesus who came among us as the ideal Israelite, who came in our place, who came on our behalf. And it was Jesus, the ideal Israelite, who gave heed to the statutes and ordinances that Moses got from his heavenly father. Jesus showed in his words and his actions how the Father wants us to shape the society that we live in. How to care for people in distress. Widows and orphans and all the rest of the distressed and vulnerable. This Jesus on our behalf 
kept himself, as James put it, unstained by the world. That is, he turned away from himself. The world tells him and us, focus on yourself. You are number one. And if you buy that, you're buying into the world. But Jesus did not turn in upon himself, but rather outward toward the neighbor. To the world, this was and still is nonsense. And Jesus lived in a world that was dominated by empire, the Roman Empire. It was a world where violence ruled, where the meek inherited zip. And so the state made a cross for this troublemaker, this one who had come down from the father of lights. A cross was his destiny and that was the end of it. But no. The same powerful love that brought Israel out of slavery brought Jesus out of the tomb. And so in him, in the risen servant of God, we have the promise of eternal life. The world, the world of violence and injustice, the resurrection says that world will never prevail. The kingdom of justice and righteousness is coming, is promised, will arrive. We live in the glow of God's victory over death and the resurrection of our brother. We live in that resurrection's hope for us as individual souls and for the world and even, dare we say, the cosmos. Something good is coming. Something just and right is coming because the righteous one could not be left aside by death. So we have hope and the world and the universe has hope and with that hope is embedded the call not just to say whoopee doo Jesus is risen great but rather we have the call to moral action not just, as we say today, thoughts and prayers. We have the call to match our confession with our compassion. As James puts it, to care for those in distress. The Olympics are calling our attention to a particular distress related to gender identity, sexuality, who are you, male or female or something else? We're just coming to understand that the rigid male-female 
finery is not supported by science. I hope you're with me on that. The traditional binary that we have, we all grew up with, there are males, there are females. End of story is not the end of the story. But there is, like with our moral situation, ambiguity going on with reproduction. So how do we speak and how do we act and how do we vote and how do we pray in a world of drag story hours, of trans individuals among us? How do we pray in a world of conflicted adolescence. The answers are far from clear. The moral ground is not safely solid. But we do have at least two things, two things that are true no matter what. One of them is grace. One of them is grace. We are saved. We are saved not by keeping the statutes and ordinances, We are saved not by putting our money where our mouth is. We are not saved by doing, but we are saved by the master whose name is Jesus. We are saved by him because he kept the statutes and ordinances for us. And the second thing that is true no matter what is God's summons to love. That never goes away. that summons to love, that call to enact mercy, to imitate Christ. Brother James put it this way, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care,
was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Given God, draw near to all those who are hurting. Be with all those who desire relief from hunger, illness, oppression, and violence. Help all leaders in our world choose peace over bloodshed. Merciful God, on this Labor Day weekend, we remember and give thanks to all who have fought for workers' rights around the world. Continue to improve working conditions and establish fair wages so that all people may thrive. Merciful God, comforting God, console us as we mourn our departed. We hold fast to the promise that death has been defeated by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us also pray for the Reverend Wang in China, Grace Food Pantry, Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance, Lutheran retreats, camps, and conferences, parents and families of lesbians and gays, Santa Barbara clergy, and Laity United for Economic Justice, Transition House, and Trinity Gardens. Merciful God, let us pray for our church family, Dorothy, Elva, Mary Jane, Jim, Bev, Maxine, John, Lorraine, Virginia, Nina, Roy, Karen, Ann, sorry, Karen, Ann and Bob, and Len. Also for Court Miller, Kevin, Lynn, the Morissettes, Dorothy, Jacqueline, Cassandra, Christina, Christopher, Randy and Sella, Robert, the Blanchard family, Beverly, Laura, Devin, Tatiana, Irina, Timu, and Yuri, and Eric, merciful God. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Um, okay, at this time, all who would like to add a prayer may do so. Finally, I'd like for all of you to join in the song, Prince of Peace by Pharaoh Sanders. I chose this because I find it very moving and the world can always have more love and peace. The choir will sing it first, and then the whole congregation will join in. Now the whole congregation.
Christ, Lord and Savior. I'd like to make a quick announcement. Next Sunday, we'll be resuming Sunday school, and all children ages 4 through 11 are welcome in the chapel at 9.30. We'll be doing arts and crafts, Bible stories, and um, music, and it'll be a really nice time. So I welcome all the families to bring their children next Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> 